Welcome to the official Guns Up Nations podcast, the premier voice for the fearless fans of Raiderland and proud supporter of Texas Tech University. Let's meet today's hosts. How's it going, everybody? Welcome into another installment of the Guns Up Nation podcast. I'm R.C. Maxfield alongside Tobias Bass down in H-Town. Is it another weather report this morning, Tobias, or what are we going with? Um, no weather report. I'm, I mean, I haven't been outside yet. I will be after this podcast, but I mean, it looks like a normal pretty day. Clouds are out. You know, no wind like usual. Hot as hell, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was uh, texting Haley. Got to give you the Haley update, too, and she was like, have fun. Um <laughs> Doing the podcast with uh, meteorologist Tobias. Yeah, and I'm thinking about I'm thinking about going back to school to do that because I want to watch Tech basketball. And part well, I might not be doing it this year at all, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah, no, I get I get it. Long term, long term. It's a long term long thing. Term. Yeah. Um, but on today's podcast, we're going to be talking about Texas Tech, the football team update. Some position coaches have talked about who stood out in camp as well as a COVID nineteen update. Coach Beard came out and had comments on the basketball roster as well and who has been standing out to him during their, what, what would we call that, training camp, maybe just early on practices. Um, yeah. And then the Marlene Stallings saga at Texas Tech does not seem to want to end. Marlene Stallings came out yesterday and said she will sue Texas Tech. We will talk about what that means and if she has a case at all. Then, of course, we got to talk about our friends over at Two Docs later on. And then the main brunks of the show today, our favorite breakout stars for Texas Tech football in 2020, Tobias and myself, will give three players on the roster each who we think will break out and become household names for Red Raider fans after the 2020 season and really during the 2020 season. But let's start with the football team. But with the COVID numbers, Texas Tech released yesterday that 1,900 student athletes have been tested for COVID-19. That goes along with the coaches and staff, as well as the student athletes, and 85 total positive cases among student athletes for all sports. Of the positive cases remaining, there's 19 active, and 12 of those are within the Red Raider football program. We've heard Matt Wells talk about it, Tobias, in the sense of there might be some issues when it comes to that first game um, and some potential starters being quarantined or, you know, a depth piece here or there that somebody that was going to play significant snaps could, you know, not play as much or at all in game one due to testing positive for COVID-19. Yeah. You know, I mean, even the people that have like recovered from the virus, that might even be a little concerning because, you know, it's a respiratory issue and, you know, people have had, you know, Rudy Gobert, he was one of the, first major athletes that tested positive for it, he was having issues still in the bubble. And that was, you know, four months down the line. So, I mean, it affects everyone differently. And, you know, hopefully those guys are able to recover and play, but you could see some fatigue, some early fatigue issues, you know, some balance issues, things like that. So that would be something I would probably look out for if I was a fan or a coach as well. Yeah, I think the respiratory aspect of it is huge because like you talked about, um, Rudy Gobert, you know, he was kind of the poster boy for, oh, this COVID stuff isn't real um, at the front, right. at the beginning. But to his credit, he did say it is very real. He made a mistake and he came up and owned it like a man. Um, but it's going to be interesting because I want to see what happens if, you know, God forbid, let's say the quarterback room becomes infected. What happens? You know, yeah. do you call on Xavier Martin in the wide receiver room who was a quarterback in high school to come be your quarterback now? How, how does that change things? Do you keep guys separate? What happens? Because, you know, sometimes I wouldn't even say sometimes I would say probably a majority of the time in college. Quarterbacks are probably roommates with each other, right. you know, even if that is off campus. Um, so I think it's going to be interesting to see how that development and, you know, those developments play out if they do actually happen. Um, obviously that's me, you know, thinking ahead and thinking of something that hasn't come true yet, but at the same time, you know, if you're Texas tech or really any athletic program right now in the country, you have to think of that. Um, and you have to think of the long-term ramifications for that individual player when it comes to health, um, you know, as well as if it's a, somebody getting drafted, right. Somebody that has the potential to get drafted. How does that impact them? If you test positive for COVID-19 and you're potentially getting drafted, do you just not come back? Like, how, how does that work? 
Um, so I think it's going to be interesting to see all of the dynamics at play. Um, but yeah, I, I really do think that it's a big issue that you talked about is the respiratory aspect of it because, mm -hmm. you know, we really don't know that much about long-term ramifications of this disease yet. We've only known about it for what, 10 months, but I'll tell yeah. you what, it had is, it has been a hell of a 10 months. That is for sure. When it comes to COVID on a positive note though, when it comes to Texas tech football, Don Williams of the AJ um, during media time with some of the coaches has been asking for depth charts or players that stand out in certain position groups. And he talked to Paul Randolph, the Texas Tech defensive line coach, earlier yesterday, and he kind of gauged a depth chart from Coach um, Randolph. Um, Ru yeah, Randolph, I'm sorry. I was about to call him Rudolph. It almost got me uh, – I was thinking of Mason up there in Pittsburgh for a second. Um, but it is Randolph. And so, Texas Tech, they have a DN, a nose tackle, and a defensive tackle. For those who don't know, that's their, their system. Um, obviously, we know that Eli Howard is going to start. Um, he's right. for sure locked in. Another guy that I think for a long time, um, in my opinion, hasn't really gotten his full shot now that he gets it, now that Broderick Washington is gone, is Jalen Hutchins. I really want to see what he can do at that nose tackle position. And then the D tackle position is kind of the interesting one to me because you have Tony Bradford, who has shown flashes, right? But there's really not a lot of proven depth behind him. And then we'll talk about this guy a little later on in our breakout stars. Um, the guy that, you know, Coach Randolph mentioned the most that has stood out in the D-line um, group has been Nelson and Banasor. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's – I'll give you a sneak peek. He's one of my breakout stars. Um for 2020 but Tobias when you look at the defensive line um, you know you always hear that old adage you know a good defensive line can cover up a bad secondary um, right. and you know vice versa a great secondary can cover up a bad pass rush right. do you think there's anybody that should be worried about the d-line for Texas Tech this year and if so what's the reason why um I think maybe not this year particularly because we do have a lot of good linebackers there. So I think that they will be able to help them. Obviously, you know, your D-line needs to be somewhat of a presence. But I think that when you have Schooler there, you have Rico Jeffers there, you have uh, Merriweather sitting there, I think those guys will be able to help, you know, this is like in the run defense for sure. I think they'll be able to come up and help make plays. I just think you need those guys just to be able to just contain. It's a good D-tackle, you know, they're not really statistical giants unless you're like Aaron Donald or some of the great ones like that. But what they do do well is just – they just contain, you know, force the guy outside, force the guy inside, and just, just be a presence right there in the middle. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing for me too is I was going to bring up the linebacking group as well was, you know, when you have the A, B, and C gaps, right, you just want your linebackers to go in there and punish people. And, you know, when you have guys like uh, Jalen Hutchins who is – He's kind of an athletic freak. I don't know if you remember him in call, or high school, but he played running back for his mm -hmm. high school team. He was a 300-pound yeah. running back. You know, refrigerator, you know, the yeah. refrigerator up in Chicago in the 80s had nothing on him. So I think it's really, you know, one of those things where, yeah, they want to get a pass rush, but I really think the pass rush is going to come from those linebackers, as you mentioned. I think it's going to come from disguised blitzes. I think Boyer Randall coming off the side at the Raider position will be huge for Texas Tech. You, you didn't mention him in the linebacking group, but that's, that's perfectly fine. You know, I think that that's really where the group will have an impact. The defensive line, like you said, is going to be like, okay, there's five offensive linemen. There's three of us. If we get double teamed, that leaves a one. Let's say Eli Howard gets double teamed. Yeah. That leaves three guys one-on-ones, -on and you hope that, you know, a Hutchings or a Bradford and then a Boyer Randall can win a one-on-one -on -one matchup and get to the quarterback, yeah. right? That's kind of what you're hoping for here. And then you can also send somebody potentially like an Eric Monroe from the secondary yeah. or something like that on the disguise blitz because we've seen what Patterson likes to do on defense, and he does like to disguise blitz, and he does like to get, you know, wreak havoc, and it's not just from the outsides on that. He might send a safety right up the A-gap and, you know, confuse the center. You know, he likes to do that kind of stuff. So I really think, like you said, is the, the linebackers are going to be critical here in terms of filling gaps, especially on the run defense, because the secondary has always been an issue at Texas Tech. You and me both agree. Yeah. We think it's going to be better this year. Um, but just how much better will it be is a, yeah. is a big question mark, because, listen, we're not dumb. We, they're playing in the yeah. Big 12. It's the Big 12, yeah. man. Every secondary is going to get lit up. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, it's just who bends the most without breaking. 
you know, that's really what it comes down to. Yeah, I think that also, like you said, with them being three down linemen on defense, those linebackers are going to have to be for sure attacked. Even Monroe, the safety that they're blitzing, they're going to be able to tackle in space because, you know, we seen it last year. You know, you throw a little tunnel screen to C.D. Lamb. If you don't tackle him immediately, it's hell to pay. You know, it's, it's things like that. So, and you know, the big four, they have weapons. Every, every team has weapons. You know, a lot of people came back. So, those linebackers in state, they're going to be able to make, have to make plays and just make tackles in open field because if you don't, you're going to, you're going to start seeing 60, 70-yard plays. And that's going to happen because it's the big 12. Stupid stuff happens. But hopefully for Tech, it'll be on the lesser side. Yeah. No, um, when you said you got to tackle them immediately, my first thought was, well, Texas tried to do that in the Cotton Bowl, and that just didn't work out. Yeah, 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 yeah. That one play, I don't know. That's, that, yeah, when you say yeah. C.D. Lamb, that's the play I think of right away. Yeah, and, and, and it's hard, and I get it, but, like, that, you know, you, you're going you're gonna to have to make plays at some point. You're going to have to tackle people. Cause yeah, I mean. This conference, is, this conference is not a good conference to be missing tackles. It's the slippery fish conference, if you ask me. Everybody's a little yeah. slippery when it comes to wide yeah. receivers and running backs, and maybe that's poor tackling, but also there's just some freak athletes in this conference for sure. Yeah. But we'll move on. Um, be sure to go to GunsUpNation.com. We got you covered for all things Texas Tech football. We're starting it next week. It's crazy to say it's a bias. Football starts next week. Can you believe that? No, no, that's crazy. I mean, yeah, NFL too. I mean, they're just, what, six days away, something like that? Yes, yeah, six yeah. days away. Patty and Deshaun Watson kick it off. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I have um, some, some nice little bets going on in that game. So, hopefully, we can, I can cash in. We don't uh, condone betting. Do it at your own risk. Going to put that caveat out there. But on the Guns Up Nation side, I mean, we're going to have a lot of great content on the website, you know, just weekly um, for yeah. everything Texas Tech football during the season as well as basketball. Um, we got Clint Proctor. He's going to be on there. He's going to do the recaps for us. And then Keith, Keith's going to do the Texas Tech weekend roundup. That'll be everything sports related. Obviously, Tobias and myself will be doing a podcast on Sunday night that'll come out Monday. Then Jacob Harris, he'll be the guy doing our film study and breaking down teams and what Texas Tech did well as well. And then Clint, Keith, and Trevor, they'll be putting out stuff showing you about the opponent that they'll be playing that week, the mm -hmm. odds and where to watch it. Trevor will be doing the game preview and getting our predictions. And then uh, obviously Tobias and I will do the podcast as well on Friday or on Thursday that will be released on Friday. And you'll be able to see what we think of that matchup this week, that particular week. And then of course, be sure to follow us for all the latest breaking news on Texas tech athletics. Let's move on though. Coach Beard yesterday talked to the media. Um, good follow and uh, good friend of the show on social media, Ryan Manville now with the double T He's the Texas – or not Double T, Daily Torador. I apologize. Mm -hmm. um, he's the basketball beat writer for them. He uh, was putting out some good content for them, so be sure to go follow him. He was talking about a lot of players yesterday was Coach Beard. Um, and the ones that kind of stood out to me, Tobias, there was three, and I'll let you comment on them um, once I get them out there, is Kevin McCullers. Apparently he put on some weight – excuse me – put on some weight this offseason, got stronger. That's good for – Kevin McCullers, considering his game is down low in the post. Not the biggest guy, but physical. And then the other one was Micah Peavy. Um, you know, you, you have those big-time freshmen come in, right? And, you know, you want them to make an impact, the Jemias Ramsey of the world and whatnot. But the way that Coach Beard described Micah Peavy and the praise that he was giving him was, I don't want to say unorthodox, but – it didn't remind me of um, a normal Coach Beard type quote. And what he said was, and again, this is from Ryan Manville, DT. Go follow him on Twitter. Um, Chris Beard says, Micah Peavy is a positionless player and can play all the way from point guard to power forward. We all knew that, right? But this is what got me a little bit because once you get a guy on campus, you don't revert to, you know, stars and um, high school, yeah. you know, games and stuff like that in yeah. terms of all American games. And Coach Beard goes, also says, also Coach Beard says, PV should have been regarded as a five-star recruit in the McDonald's All-American. So in my mind, when I hear that, Tobias, PV's you know one of the top two guys in camp right now, standing out. Yeah. You yeah. know that, that that's that's really what you got to take that as, right? And then one more real quick, um, and this one is just because, oh my goodness, I love the bias, and you know how I felt about this guy last year, um, Tyreek Smith before he got injured. Yeah. You and I had arguments over who was 
who, whose guy this was going to be, if you remember mm-hmm. that. Um, yeah. Tyreek Smith will make people mention him, Coach Beard said on the red shirt freshman. Beard also mentions he is competing for major minutes and predicts an improvement in his three-point shooting. So what I'm hearing in my head is Tyreek Smith and Joel and Topway are competing for minutes right now. Yeah, that's a good problem to have. I think, you're not, you're not going to hear me complain. Yeah, yeah. I, think that's a, I think that's a great problem to have. Well, first of all, PV is – I talk about every time I just watch him, he's like the tallest 6'7 kid I've ever seen. He looks like he's taller than 6'7. I maybe, think it maybe, might be the hair. I thought about that because I knew you'd bring that up. It's got to be the hair, right? Maybe he he just looks he just looks big like he just looks like a big kid but but um I mean yeah he's a, he's a he's very very versatile and I've been hearing a lot of things about him as well and came I heard that he came in and you know he's really opened up some eyes I mean they knew he was good they recruited him obviously but they were just like wow he came in and he just looks awesome that's what I've been uh, that's what I've been told and that's also speaking about Tariq I mean that's good he's able to improve his three point shooting because I think that'll be a major key for Tech, especially in the pick and pop game, because, you know, Joel can make shots. It doesn't hurt to bring another guy off the bench or if he starts in Tariq, that can make shots as well, because, you know, you have your rebounding machine down low with Santos Silva. So those other guys are going to have to be able to make shots. And we talked about this in our last podcast, I believe. I am thinking you're going to start seeing some three-guard lineups with Tech. So you're going to be able to need one of those bigs on the floor to be able to stretch the floor. So maybe it's both. You know, maybe you could run a five out or a four out one in, something like that. But for him to be able to improve his jump shot, like Nambi D and Kite, I know Tech fans don't like to hear that, but he improved his three-point shooting a lot over his freshman through his senior year. He was able – he actually – I think he took 55 of them last year. He made like 20-something, so he shot like 36%, something around there. So he's able to – if Tariq can come in, his first year in a Tech jersey and shoot around that number, I think that's a big, a big plus for them. So th- we're a long ways out from – Texas Tech playing basketball, yeah. you know, right? But still, we need to talk about this. And, and the first question that came into my mind, because, you know, we're talking a lot about a lot of guys, right, Tobias? We're talking right. – I, I think, you know, in the past three or four podcasts we've done, we've talked about virtually everybody on this roster potentially playing a little bit, right? So my question to you is this. When it comes to minutes per game at the end of the year, how many people – or I, I should say players, how many players for Texas Tech will be averaging over 27 and a half minutes per game? How many? How many? Because in my head, you know, and Texas Tech fans will remember this, gone, this guy fondly, Keenan Evans, you know, you have that guy, right? Is there a guy like that on this roster that will command, you know, 30 plus minutes a game? Because I don't know if there is. I think it's just going to be a lot of mix and matching and whoever's hot that night gets to play. Yeah, I think that's kind of, I mean, we know Beard have Beard likes to sub anyway. So I don't even, I think this is a prime example of a team where he's going to be subbing a lot. Um, I kind of have mixed feelings about that. It, it, it's just, it's very scenario based and situational based, but Beard likes to sub. So I think I agree with you. I don't think it's going to be, yeah, I think it's going to be whoever has the hot hand. I said maybe. So how many, I don't even know. how many Go players ahead. you got over 27 and a half minutes per game averaging for the whole season? Mm. it's hard for me I feel like that's the perfect number because I think there yeah. might be a few guys that average like 26 and 27 but yeah. I don't know if anybody gets over 27 and a half well yeah, I remember you know beer last year he was you know he was taking some heat for playing the starters too much well I think that this year that will not be an issue at all I think okay. guys are going to be very very I mean you have plumes you have you can start these five guys and you can put these other five guys that's why I wish I was a fly on the wall of some of these practices because you have 10 11 guys that they, they need minutes, you know, yeah. is that type of thing. So I think that um, you're going to just be, like you said, whoever's having a hot night or whoever's playing better, you know, because you're going to see games where I think the starters might be playing better. He'll just throw the bench in there like, y'all play. Y'all, be, y'all finish it. And they're more than capable of doing it. Yeah, they're more than, yeah, they're more than capable of doing it. Yeah. Did you okay, see so, uh, Max Dunk yesterday? Yeah, that was dumb. Um, by the way, everybody saying travel in the comments. Um, get the hell out of here. No crap. It was, no, no crap. Yeah, it was no. a travel. Who, who gives a damn? This ain't a game. Yeah. You're going to call travel in a dunk contest too? Get the hell out of here. Yeah. But, I mean, if you were looking at the travel, you're just a weird kid. Like, he's, <laughs> yeah. he's practicing. Like, he's in the gym with, his, with some of his teammates just messing around. I mean, like, I don't, I don't want to – like, why are you looking at the travel? He's not practicing. Like, he was, he was literally the only one on the entire gym with a ball in their hand. Yeah. So, like, he could have quadrupled – he could have traveled, carried, 
did a 360. That that doesn't matter. What matters is the dunk. Yeah. And I'm waiting. I mean, we, we probably can't do it because it's stupid COVID. But there needs to be a way where he can – maybe Raver, the TV, can put this on. They need to have a dunk contest with – some of those guys in the team, they need to somehow construct it, even if they pre recorded something. They need yeah. to have a dunk contest. We have too many teams people on this roster that have bounce. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, the first guys that came to my mind that I'd want to see is Shannon Jr., obviously. Yeah. Uh, yeah. McClung. And then I think PV would be fun to watch, too. Um, I mean, then to yeah, I was, I was about to say, put Tyreek in there as well. I think those are the four that just would have to be in it. Now, they have to be. Real quick question. It's September 3rd or September 4th, I think. I'm putting you on the spot right now. Um, mm. Who is the top five? You cannot change your answer, quote unquote, right now. If the season started today, who is the starting five for Texas Tech? Assume that McClung and Burton get their waivers. Burnett. Joe Burnett. Burnett Santos Silva for sure. I think. He'll probably start Kyler. Um, PV. Uh, you, th- you think he's going to start Kyler? I think he might. He might start him early just because he's a, he's a, one of the most Spanish guys on the roster. I think. I think, I that, think that, maybe, okay, maybe fair, point, fair point. Fair point. Fair point. Could he? Could he? Could he finish like that? No, I think that at some point he will probably come off the bench. But I think at first, I think Kyler will will probably start. I didn't even think yeah. about it like that. So I think Kyler. Namari, oh, I'm, okay, yeah, Kyla, Namari, Shannon, Santos, Silva, and Peavy. Wow, so you don't think Joel starts? He, he could be the start between him and Tyreek. Well, I think Santos, you have to start him. No, I, I, I think, agree. I think, yeah, I, I, no, I don't think Joel, I don't think Joel, no. Santos, Santos, he has to start. I don't, I don't care. If anyone has to start, it's Shannon and him. They, have, they need to start. Yeah, I think for me, um, I would go Namari, Mac, Shannon, Joel, yeah. and Santos, Silva. That's fine. That's that's fine too. That's because fine. Joel I mean, stretches the floor and he can play a point forward type role. I don't feel great about him yeah. doing that all game long, but if there's, you know, four or five possessions that he does that throughout the game, by all means, do your thing, young man. Yeah. That's how I think. I about think it. that you could even see a similar I mean, you know how we talked about this last podcast at West Virginia, they run a high low, they have cover on the wing, sort of elbow ish, mm-hmm. and they have a big O down low. I think you could see Tech do the same thing with Joel. Or if Tyreek's down there, or Joel on the elbow, and Santos Silva down there, because it just you just have space. You know, you don't need two guys back toward the basket down there. He's not anymore. I think yeah. you could probably see that sort of lineup as well. Or you can even put PV. He's however tall he is. You could put him at the four sometimes and see just do the same thing. I mean, that's what Coach Beard said. You know, you could put PV at the four at some points, and I would expect yeah. it to have. I would expect a lineup this year that goes something along the lines of Joel, PV, Shannon, Mack, and Namari. Yeah. I would. I, it would not shock me if eventually that's the starting five. You know, if they just want to run and gun and just beat the crap out of people, just you know, in terms of versatility. Um, and then Santos Silva just comes in on the second unit and does all the dirty work and just bullies people. Yeah. It wouldn't surprise me. I, I. But the thing is, again, it goes back to that minute total. Yeah, you can technically be the starter, but the guys on the bench, they're still going to play significant minutes. Oh yeah, you know? for sure. I, I. It would shock me. You know if this team isn't, you know, by tournament time, and we fully expect it to be in the tournament. We expect it to be a top 15 team all year long. Um, well, I mean, I'm just playing conservative. Yeah, right no, yeah, yeah. No, I got you. You know uh, how I feel. Yeah. I want to give myself a little wiggle room. Um, yeah. But, I mean, it, w- it wouldn't surprise me if there's nine guys on this team that are – at or over, or at least within a minute and a half of playing 15 minutes a game. Yeah. It would not, not surprise sure. me, like, at all. I, I really do think it's going to be, you know, one game it'll be Joel – or not Joel, but, it, you know, against West Virginia, it'll be, you know, a starting lineup of Santos Silva and Tyreek in the front court to right. play against Big O and Culver down there. And yeah. then literally the next game, let's just say they're playing Iowa State, it wouldn't surprise me if it's the lineup that I just mentioned with Joel, PV yeah. – you know, Shannon, Mack, and Namari, just to, you know, space out the floor. And, you know, I think that's the beautiful thing about this roster is if it stays healthy, and that's a huge if right now, mm-hmm. um, considering all the circumstances and just injuries happen anyway. This team is so loaded that, you know, God forbid an injury does happen, it's okay It'd because be they're deep. Last year, you know, yeah. if Holyfield got hurt, we were screwed at the yeah. front court. But, yeah. you know, this year, again, God forbid, if something happens to Santos Silva where he has to miss a game, I don't feel 
awful about it. I would want him to come back quickly, obviously, but I don't feel awful about Texas Tech's chances. Yeah, I agree. One thing I want to see, I mean, I don't think this will be an issue. I think we have a a group of good guys, but I want to see how Beard manages this ego is playing time, made expectation, because, you know, sometimes the kids will be fine, but the parents are awful. Not saying we have sure. any bad parents, but, you know, this team is deep, and, you know, everyone's kid wants to play X amount, and I get it, and I get it. But this team is very deep. You know, we have a lot of good guys in the roster. People need to play. So yeah. I want to see if – I don't think we'll have this issue, but I know other schools, you know, they, they've had issues like that. So I want to hopefully, you know, that won't become an issue, and then the parents understand, the players understand that, you know, this is what you signed up for. You knew what the roster was like before you came. So there's going to be times where you might not finish a game. There might be times where you don't start a game. There might be a game where your minutes might be limited. It might not even be because you're playing, but it might just because such and such is having a good game. Yeah, exactly. So you're going to be selfish or you're going to be able to just be okay with it. And I think Coach Beard has done a really good job about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but to be fair to him as well, and you know, kind of to your point right now, he's never had a roster like this. Yeah, yeah. There's never been – I mean, simple and plain, there's never been a roster like this in Texas Tech men's basketball history regardless of the coach. There just hasn't. Like, this team is absolutely loaded. And Tobias mentioned it earlier. You could take five guys off of the bench for Texas Tech and you could start them at a Big 12 school and oh, yeah. they would probably finish, like, eighth or ninth. Yeah. Like, you could do that. So, it's going to be interesting. Slowly approaching uh, basketball season, and we all know we're a basketball school at this point. So we'll yep. move on. And speaking of basketball, the saga continues with Marlene Stallings. She announced yesterday that she will sue Texas Tech University, claiming she was fired without cause. Um, many Tech fans will remember that Stallings was fired after a USA Today article came out um, surfacing the environment that was described as toxic and abusive for players within the program. Multiple players came out um, and voiced their displeasure, as well as, you know, some of the allegations against stalling and, you know, confirming them as well. Um, and now Texas Tech has head coach Krista Gerlich, the former 1990, 1993 guard that played with Cheryl Swoops. She came back home, the famous alumni. But Tobias, I, I make a whole lot of nothing out of this. Like, I get why she's doing it. Um, yeah. But... Because, because effectively her career is over. Yeah. Um, as any kind of head coach, unless she just, you know, takes a five-year hiatus, works her way up as an assistant again, and then some school kind of just takes a chance on her. But it's never going to be, you know, big-time D1 basketball, I don't think. Right. So, yeah, I mean – I get what she's doing. Yeah, it's just, it's just weird. Like, I know, like, she's – um, what are you – what is she going like, money? Like, I mean, unless she's going to get, like, another opportunity. But in the near future, she's not going to get an opportunity. You know, there were several girls that came out and spoke – you know, poorly about what, you know, what she did to them. And those are just the ones that have spoke out. We did, God knows what, what, what hasn't been said yet, you know, exactly. that type of thing. And um, I don't know. It's just, like, I, I get it, but she's not going to win. Yeah. Like, 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 like you're not going to win. Like there have been multiple, multiple things coming out against you. Like, I don't know. It's, it's kind of like my little brother. He, he's, he's, I love him to death, but he's just like, he does bad things. I'm like, Donald, like, why are you doing these bad things? I haven't done anything wrong. My mom pulls out like a notepad of this is everything he's done for the week. I'm like, Donald, like, it's over. Like, you, there's nothing you can do. Like, you, you, everyone has said poorly about your behavior the last three days. Teacher, my grandparents, your own dad, your sister, me, and your mom. Like, there's been six eyewitnesses attesting to what you've done. How can you possibly say you've done nothing wrong and deserve to watch TV or whatever it is? Yeah. Um, it, it just screams a Mike Leach situation to me all over again yeah. um, in terms of him suing the university and never getting his paycheck and same thing. You know, that's what it screams to me. And, you, you, you know, honestly, I mean, Stallings is worse than Mike Leach in terms of what she did. Um, yeah. You know, obviously Leach, we don't condone what he did, but at the same time, it, you know, you read reports and everything. And if you're into conspiracy theories and all that kind of stuff, and Texas Tech fans usually are when it comes to Mike Leach, um, you know, Craig James's son locked in a shed for practice. Like, yeah, yeah. There's 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 a lot of things on Mike Leach's side, but at the same time, there's a lot of things on James's side. And it's like, okay, like, whatever. We'll move on, kind of deal. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be interesting to see how that all works out for her because when I look at it, there's no case. Like, you know, yeah. if it was one player, I'd be like, okay, like you maybe have a case. Maybe that player was just pissed because you didn't give her enough minutes. But we're talking double digit players at this point. Yeah. We're, yeah, we're not, yeah the whole team. Yeah, it's not one. It, it, it's like one plus another number at the end of it. You know what I mean? Players, at least. Yeah, the players are transferred and have came back and like, oh, yeah, she did that. Yeah, like multiple players have transferred. Yeah. Said the same thing. Yeah, so right. I mean, it's, it's not going to end well for her. But you know what is going to end gonna... well, Tobias? What's that? If we go to two docks, man, we need to go to two docks sometime. We do. Lubbock. Especially with all this chaos going on. We come back to Lubbock and watch some basketball games, some football games, whatever's going go. on. And, and if you can't get into the Jones, and right now it's kind of difficult to do that, only 25% capacity, go watch the game at two docks. Great beer, live music. Great food trucks there at all times with the family-friendly staff and environment. You can bring your, do your dog out there as well as long as he's on a leash. And right now, if you go to twodocs.com and you use the promo code GUNSUP, on your order over $49 or more, you will get free shipping. Again, if you use the code GUNSUP, you get free shipping on orders of $49 or more at twodocs.com. You can support a local business, have great craft beer, Enjoy live music. Go watch a Texas Tech game out there. Go play some cornhole with your friends. I promise, Tobias, I will dominate you anytime, anywhere at cornhole. You know what I'm about. We've played like six, seven times together, and I am undefeated, and I will keep that streak alive at two blocks while I am hammered. I will do it. I don't think that's true. It's 100% true. You know, me, I, was the me, KT, uh, I was the KTXT god at cornhole. What are you talking about? That day, I wonder, well, why were we outside that? It was that freshman thing in the parking yeah. lot behind. I won a couple of games. No, no, you didn't. Then when I played with Marshall's mom, and it was you and Marshall, yeah, whoever but, you was on your yeah. – Well, yeah, I beat you. I, I'll beat you outside. I'll beat you in the hallway of MCOM. I'll beat you anywhere. And I'll even beat you at Two Docks with a beer in my hand. So go to Two Docks. It's off of Texas Avenue, 502 Texas Avenue in downtown Lubbock. Tell them Guns Up sent you. And, again, the promo code is Guns Up on their website. And if you spend $49 or more and use the code Guns Up, you get free shipping. And, again, tell us what you think of Two Docs and tell them that we sent you over there down in the 806. We're going to move on. The big brunt of the show now. Favorite breakout stars for Texas Tech football in 2020, Tobias and I each have a list of three Tobias, you want to go first, or you want me to go first, or how we want to do this? Um, I'll, I'll go first. Okay. Knock out your first okay. one. My first one is uh, Zach McPherson. You know how I feel about this guy. Last year he played um, – he, played a lot. he had 42 total tackles. But the biggest thing was for me, he didn't have any interceptions. I think that this year he'll – I think he'll get a couple, in, a couple of those. I think I'll probably say between three and five. He won't do what Douglas Coleman did last year, but I think he will get a few interceptions this year. I think he breaks out, especially with – um. Adrian Fried going back to his normal corner position. I think teams early, they might try to pick on him, and I think that he'll show why he was a former high four-star recruit. Yeah, I like Zach McPherson a lot. I, th I think yeah. um, personally, I, I really like the trio of Fry, McPherson, and Ingram. Um, you know, there yeah. might be a little changes there and everything with DeMarcus Fields back as well. Um, so I really like the secondary, and you're going to name another guy I know in your breakouts uh, later on that's part of the secondary, but – the thing with the secondary for me is just the depth. It's questionable. I really like the guys that are starting, and there's a couple of guys in the depth chart that I like after those guys. But in the secondary in the Big 12, we all know you want to get as close as to 10 startable guys or, like, guys that can play yeah. impactful snaps in your secondary. And I just don't know if Texas Tech has that right now. I'd probably have them around eight, I think, is a fair number. Um, so, yeah, but, no, McPherson is one of them for sure. Uh, my first breakout is, well, if you've been to the website and you've seen our predictions for 2020, I had Texas Tech going five and five, um, and I had a historic season from one of the players on offense um, at the wide receiver position. It's Eric Uzikama. Um, I think he is going to have a historic, and I legitimately mean historic type season for the Red Raiders last year. He led the Red Raiders in receiving as a true sophomore. 
or as a redshirt sophomore, I should say, um, redshirt freshman, my goodness, I cannot talk today, Tobias. This is what we get for doing a podcast at nine in the morning <laughs> right now. But no, I, I really like Uzakama for multiple reasons, okay? And, and the reason really being is just his physicality. You look at his size, right? He's 6'3", 220. He runs in that 4'4 range, and he, he just he kind of sneaks up on you. You know what I mean? When you look at him, you know, he looks like a presence, right? He, he definitely looks like that prototypical wide receiver where you're like, oh, that guy's going to be a stud, right? But then you see him, he just, he, he's kind of lengthier than you expect at 6'3". He's got almost like a, not a TJ Vasher type body, but maybe just a little bit bigger. And he just goes up and he gets any kind of ball. He can contort his body in the air. And let me go back to this historic season that I think Eric Uzikama will have, okay? I think he will lead the Red Raiders in receiving and have over 1,200 yards. Mm. I'm going to name you the people in this program's history that have had 1,200 yards receiving in a season, Tobias. You ready for this? Go oh, ahead. Yeah. I'm going to start from eight and go up. Amendola, Hill, Grant, Fioli, Amaro, Wesley, QT, and some guy by the name of Crabtree. You look at this, mm. there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of those guys played in the NFL or on practice. All eight of them played in the NFL were on practice squads, and then other ones played multiple years in the NFL. Yeah. And I think Eric Uzakama has the potential to be the ninth guy in Texas Tech program history to go out there and become an elite, elite receiver. He, he, he just does too many things well, you know, like there, there's guys like, and this isn't a knock on TJ Vasher at all, but TJ Vasher is a kind of a high point guy. You know, he doesn't really go across the middle too much, right? It's kind of the outside right. guy, throw it higher than the corner. And you know what? It works a lot. Eric Uzakama can do everything. He can go across the middle. He can run a post. He can run a slant. He can run a bubble screen. You know, he can run a nine route. You can throw it high to him and he can go get it. So I really think he's that next guy. When you think of great Texas tech wide receivers, I think it's easy E as they call him within the program. And I think 2020 is the year that he breaks out and proves that. Yeah, I think he, I mean, I think he definitely has the tools. One of the guys I want to talk about in my breakout stars, I think it's going to help him significantly. Cause I mean, you've been seeing people all over the country been talking about uh, easy um, this summer. I think that he's really going to be the next biggest star. And I think he has, um, I think he has like some juice about him that will, he'll be very draftable in a year. I think that he has like those qualities of a receiver that you want to pick in the NFL. Yeah, no, I, it would not shock me if this is the last year he's at Texas tech. It, it really yeah, wouldn't same. because, same. you know, you look at his numbers from last year and they're not great by any stretch of the imagination, you know, 700 or not even 700 yards, about 660 yards receiving um, in that range. Like, it's not great, but you have to realize that's with the third string quarterback or a backup quarterback, I should say, basically a third string at that point. Um, so you're looking at it and everything, and he still led the team in receiving as a red shirt freshman, made an impact, and you saw flashes, man. You just saw flashes where you were like, okay, the kid's got it. It's, he's just got to get his guy back in Allen Bowman, and if Allen Bowman stays healthy or the quarterback position just takes that next step, that's going to be huge for him because he's going to have yeah. that stability at that position, and then he can really cement himself as one of those great Texas Tech wide receivers. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Who's your second um, guy, Tobias? My next second guy is uh, TJ Vasher. I mean, it's kind of hard oh, for him to break out. Yeah, it's kind of hard for him to break out. But last year, he only played 10 games. He had six touchdowns in 10 games. He was having some um, off-the-field issues, per se. Um, I think that this is the season where I think he reminds people – who he is, you know, he's been here. This will be his, what, his fifth year here now, which yes. seems like that's crazy to me. But, you know, teams wanted to draft him. You know, teams wanted to draft him a year ago, the year before, but he just kind of couldn't get right. I think that this is the year I think he finally matures. He's like, you know, I need to get serious. I'm only going to be here six to eight more months. If I do have a good season, this could be the season I could get drafted. It might not be where I wanted to go, but money is money. NFL is the NFL. So I think that he – um. Breaks out. I think that him and EZ will be a nice little uh, tandem together, and I think that they'll be able to complement each other well. Give me a stat line for Vasher. What do you think he does this year? You said you said you think EZ gets how many yards? Eleven hundred, twelve hundred. Twelve hundred. Okay. I think he I, he, I, he literally becomes like he has a top nine season in Texas Tech program history in receiving yards. Yeah, I think I'll agree. I think that he'll um, – easy will lead tech in receiving. But I think that Vasher will probably do some touchdowns. So, he had six last year. I think if he plays all all the games, 
I think he could have 10, 11 touchdowns, probably 800 yards. I think he could do that. I could see that. I, I think for Vasher, I mean, I would even probably say if he does play all the games, he might get a couple of more yards. It wouldn't shock me if he got to over 1,000 or just like right below it. But the touchdowns is the big thing for me. You knew what my – you remember what my prediction was last year uh, for him. I said that T.J. Vasher would have double-digit touchdowns. And um, it looked like we were well on the way to do that. And then it just kind of staled off at the end because of off-the-field issues and playing time and all that kind of stuff. So um, it will be interesting to see if T.J. is here for just this one more year or, you know, if maybe things don't go his way. Remember, he can come back next year because of that yeah. free year. So, yeah. you know, he's kind of got two cracks at it right now. Um, does Vasher in terms of getting to where he wants to be in terms of NFL prospects and stuff like that. Um, my second person, I'm going to flip the script. My next two are going to be on defense. Um, and one of them, I mentioned earlier in the show that we'd mention them here in the breakouts. It's going to be Nelson and Bamasor. Um, and I just butchered his name in Bonasor, I should say. <laughs> my goodness. Um, so when I look at these kind of guys, you know, you, you, you look at his size and you know, he's 6'3", 275 right now. At least that's what he's listed as. I think he's probably a little bit bigger seeing some of the tape. I would probably venture to say he's probably in that 285, 290 range. When you look at these guys and you see the coaches, like uh, Coach Randolph, the defensive line coach who we mentioned earlier, um, say positive things about these guys that have already made at least, you know, an impact in the Texas Tech rotation on the defensive line. And now that there's meaningful snaps there with Broderick gone and, stuff like that, and other guys leaving, you look at it, these are the kind of guys that usually take that next step in successful programs, right? So Jalen Hutchings, I love him. I would pick him as a breakout, but I think everybody's picking him as a breakout. Yeah. So I wanted to go with Nelson and show him some love because when I look at his tape last year, and I watched it a little bit yesterday when I saw Coach Randolph make those comments, I was like, I don't really remember – Nelson making you know an impact and and maybe that was yeah. just me when I was going in I kind of kept an open mind about it and I said that could just be me you know just not remembering right and of course it was it was 100% me not remembering um and I, and there was just games where I was like you know he didn't get a tackle right but he was the reason that somebody else got one um or he's not the guy that got the sack or the tackle for loss, but he's the reason that Jordan Brooks got one because the quarterback had to roll right into Jordan Brooks, right? Something, some plays like that. And, you know, that's what defensive linemen are about. You talked about it earlier, Tobias. Not everybody's going to be Aaron Donald and have 20-plus right. sacks in a year, right. right? A bunch of their effectiveness and, you know, what they help their team in doing, it doesn't show up in the stat sheet, yeah. you know? It really doesn't. It goes to the linebackers, the defensive ends. And when you're a defensive tackle or a defensive uh, – or nose tackle in this – you know, system for Texas Tech, mm -hmm. um, and I guess in, you know, Nelson's case, he's a DN. Just if you're a defensive lineman in the scheme for Texas Tech, it's very hard and difficult mm -hmm. to get, you know, substantial stats. You know, Eli could do it because Eli's different. You know, he, he's, a, he's a really yeah. good player, and that, that's just what happens. And I'm not saying Nelson can't be, but what right. I'm saying is it takes time for that to happen, and there's no – you know, knock on him and saying, when you look at the stats, like, oh, he hasn't done much. Well, numbers lie in this regard. You have to go sure. watch the film. And I'll admit, I was one of the guys where I was like, well, the numbers don't really eye pop just for even being in the rotation. Yeah. And then I turned on the film and I was like, okay, I'm wrong. I don't know why I, fe you know, fed into that, you know, numbers don't lie stuff, especially on a defensive lineman. Um, but yeah, I think um, Nelson is going to have a great year. And I, and I really think that the Texas Tech D-line you know, I have a lot of question marks about it right now, but it wouldn't surprise me if, you know, Hutchings, Bradford, Howard, and uh, Nelson as well really mm -hmm. show out. And that's a really solid foursome that they have on that defensive line moving forward. Yeah, this is an extreme example because it's some of the best players in the world. But you look at last year with the Bears defense, Eddie Goldman, the DT, he gets hurt. Khalil Mack kind of disappeared. I don't hate to say it's because Khalil Mack, but he didn't play as well because that defensive tackle is missing and he's not there to – you know, DTs, they're really just in the way. They're just big, big dudes are just in the way. You don't want to run into them because you're going to get hurt. So they're just there, just kind of just neutral. But, you know, if you get a, if you get a, um, if a defense like an Ambanon, so if he plays well, you're going to see guys like Eli Howard, Rico, they're going to pop instantly. Because if you have a good defensive tackle, everything around that defensive line, that front seven just goes well. And I think that if he plays well, Eli Howard, you can see him have a breakout season. You can see Rico Jeffers have even a better season. You can see 
schooler, those guys, they really start to pop. But you need a defensive tackle that's going to be there to neutralize that, that from the jump. And it's interesting to me because, you know, you say defensive tackle, and that's what I think Nelson is as well, but he's listed as a D end. And, it, and it's interesting. He's, you know, on the depth chart behind Eli Howard, but his body type, I would love to see him, um, him and Tony Bradford just basically like interchange, you know, like, hey, you're going to go out and you're going to give me all you can for these three plays. And then Nelson's going to come in and do the same thing. And you just continually right. do that. So the motor is always there because I really do think, like you said, that if these guys like Hutchings, Bradford, you know, as well as Nelson, they, they don't even have to break out. They just have to be somewhat impactful. I truly believe Eli Howard will have a career year and it wouldn't shock me, you know, if he gets close to, you know, eight sacks, something like that, maybe a little higher. Yeah, and, and then yeah. I think also the guy that's going to benefit from a defensive tackle is the guy that's starting at the Raider position and Boyer Randall. I think yeah. that, you know, he's going to have a true impact there because you look at that position last year in terms of, you know, dropping back into coverage as well as rushing the passer. It's 60-40 in terms of rushing the passer for Coach Patterson there. So it's an extra lineman essentially. And, again, we talked about it earlier if Eli Howard's getting double teamed, everybody else is on an island, and then you send one more guy, it's six on five, and you got a chance. So that's how I think about it. But, yeah. Tobias, um, I know you're excited about the last guy you want to mention on your breakouts. I'll save mine for last. Talk about this uh, impactful transfer that you're excited about. Um, it's Eric Monroe's transfer from LSU. I, I like what he brings to the table. He's super versatile. We kind of talked about him earlier. I think he's going to be a guy where you can see he's being sent on blisters a lot. He's going to be playing that little rover position. Um, I think we need that, especially, you know, I think that if he pops, this secondary can be very good. We're, we're going to need him, obviously, because you're playing against some explosive offenses in this conference. But if he pops, I think that um, this secondary could be a – It'd be a plus side for this defense. I mean, I don't think they'll be as good as a linebacker, but I think they'll definitely be the second best, you know, group on this uh, defense. Um, he's going to be all over the field. He's a little light, but I think that he's going to be able to make plays, you know, getting PBUs, interceptions. I think that he could just play that rover guy. Where we, what was the guy um, a few years ago? Um, he got he, he could Deshaun John. Yeah, I think he could be him or the other, or the other guy that got suspended. He can play the whole year because of the oh, issue. Oh, my goodness. I can picture his face. Parker. Parker, yeah. Yeah, I think that um, he can play a similar type role, just just feast in the back, you know, just getting a lot of interceptions. And I think that uh, with Fry being that lockdown corner, I think McPherson takes another step forward. I think this could be a year where you see him get a lot of interceptions or just being in the way and just making plays all over the field. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see um, Monroe because Texas Tech, you know, they had Deshaun Johnson. This is not a knock on him. But if we're just going off pedigree, Eric Monroe is better than Deshaun Johnson. Um, again, not a knock on Deshaun Johnson because he was actually a really good player at Texas Tech. Um, you know, ha kind of a up and down kind of career, was great as a freshman, struggled as a sophomore, was great as a junior, and then was, you know, even to his own account as a senior was, you know, up and down. Um, but Monroe, I, I like where you're talked about in the terms of he's going to play kind of a center fielder role where you want the guy in your safety position to know what the hell he's talking about. Right. right. And you want him to be able to see the field and you want him to be able to communicate properly. And you look at the tape that Texas Tech has been releasing. I don't know if you saw the video of Eric Monroe where he was mic'd yeah. up. That, that's kind of what you want from your safety. He wasn't just interacting right. with corners. He was interacting with defensive linemen. He was interacting right. with people on offense. You know, and good safeties, they don't just talk to defensive players. They talk to wide receivers to see what the wide receiver is looking for in a safety right. to get better. Right. Talking to the quarterback. You saw him talking to Alan Bowman. Like, what are you looking for in a safety to know where he's going? Is it eyes? Is it hips? Is it feet? What is it? Is it he's leaning? What is it? And I, I think Eric Monroe has really came in and, you know, a this is a testament to him. He came in and he, he's become a leader right off the bat. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's very difficult to do, especially late in the process. And I mean, it's probably even more extremely difficult because we're in the midst of a global pandemic. So you don't get to see yeah. your teammates as often. So right. when he has been on the field around his teammates, he's obviously made an impact. The coaches have talked about him. Matt Wells has mentioned him and put him in a light as a leader of that defense. And I think if he does the things that you say in terms of he's kind of that center fielder, he can come up and pop you in the mouth and he can go back there and play center field and help, you know, I know I'm, I'm bringing up your guy here, but it's inevitable to happen to any of the corners. Let's just say yeah. McPherson lets somebody get by him. Monroe's yeah. capable of going over there and helping out. 
right? For sure. So I, I really like the center field capabilities of him, but I'm curious to see who they start next to him because that's really going to tell you if he's going to play more yeah. up in the box or if he is going to play that center fielder type role. When he was being recruited, his instincts were – they graded him. His instincts were a 10, closing speed was a 9, and playmaking was a 9. And also people, you know, forget – he was on the LSU team last year. He didn't play a bunch, but, you know, he saw a lot. You know, yeah. he saw a lot. Yeah, he I, saw I mean, the reason he didn't play was because of Grant Dalpit. Yeah, and that he, That's the, that was the guy in front of him. Yeah, Grant Dalpit was literally, you know, a guy that was uh, a, a second-round pick by the Browns, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, Dalpit, he was a second-round pick um, by the Browns. But, you're right, I mean, Dalpit, he won a defensive back of the year. So, you, you see what type of athlete, athletes they have at LSU, but – he still saw Jamar Chase every day, Justin Jefferson every day, Joe Barrow, Clyde Everett Hilaire. He played against those guys every day in practice. So I think, you know, he's not concerned about coming to the Big 12 and playing team, some of these other guys. He won't be, quote, unquote, I guess, scared or anything because he's seen the best of the best. He was on arguably the best football team in college football ever. So not to mention, I think that uh, he got to play Clemson and all those kind of teams too. Yeah, exactly. Alabama yeah, exactly. and everybody else. Judy, yeah, exactly. you know, Waddle, yeah. all those guys. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's – he, he – He's definitely one of those guys, I think, if you, if you put a list together of, let's say, five guys, right, if these five players break out and, like, legit not meet their potential because nobody in college is going to meet their potential, right, but the potential that they could get at the college level, what happens for Texas Tech, right? Because I think, for me, those guys have to be Alan Bowman. It has to be T.J. Vasher. It has to be Monroe. It has to be Rico. And then yeah. I think Eli Howard is the last one. If those guys absolutely reach their potential in terms of just what their potential is in college, Texas Tech might be looking at seven and three. You know, yeah. if the offensive line holds up, I think it will. Um, I love the Josh Berger edition, you know, a former All American at Wofford. Um, yeah. So, I don't know where he plays. They haven't, met, they haven't determined that yet because that offensive line apparently is just kind of being shuffled through. The only ones that we know for sure are Deaton and Anderson at center and right guard. Um, you know, if you, th those guys are so instrumental. And I think if you had to tell me, hey, pick which one you think is going to reach his max potential in terms of at the college level this year, I'd probably go with Monroe. Because yeah. I'm not saying this, the you know, competition is a major step down from the Big 12. Uh, from the SEC to the Big 12, it kind of is. But at the receiving level, I don't know how much of it it is, right? You know, I, I think if you look at the receiving level, just strictly receivers, SEC and Big 12 is pretty comparable. I would probably say the SEC is still better, right? Um, but just in terms of the offenses at the Big 12 level and how fast they go, that's the big thing for Monroe this year. And I think, you know, again, is he going to play in the box a lot? Is he going to be kind of a hybrid and play in the box? And then is he going to go out and play center field? Which one is he going to do more of? I think that's going to be really telling of what this coaching staff thinks of him and the kind of impact he can have in 2020. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. All right. One more breakout. Tobias, you know I had to put my guy on there. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you know I had to put my guy on there. Uh, I've, I, I've been on this guy – Tobias can attest to it. Ever since he committed to Texas Tech, I have been on this guy, and that's Kershawn Merriweather. I absolutely love this guy, and apparently the coaching staff did too. Did you see the depth chart yesterday that came out for the linebackers? Mm -mm, I didn't see it. Guess who's listed as the number one linebacker on Texas Tech's depth chart? Merriweather. Merriweather, a high, ahead of Rico. Yep. Wow. Yeah, so that tells you the kind of impact this guy has had so far. Uh, since he's been transferring uh, from Garden City Community College. And speaking of his stats at the NGCAA level, um, he was an All-American, second teamer. He led the nation in tackles as a sophomore, 157 mm. tackles – or 153 tackles over mm. 11 games, including 10 for loss and three and a half sacks while he forced a fumble and recovered a fumble. He averaged 13.9 tackles per game. Tobias, I – you know how much I love this kid. He's built like a bowling ball, man. He's six foot yeah. two forty. He runs in that four five five range. I would say not not crazy quick. I would probably say four five five to four six is probably where he's running. But man, he can just when he hits you, you're gonna feel it. You know, and, and that's what I love about linebackers at Texas Tech. And the crazy thing is, uh, if you look at Texas Tech linebackers, and I, again, I, I love Merriweather the most. Uh, you know that 
But there's an argument to be had where you could say, like, he's the fourth best linebacker on this roster. Yeah, you, I mean, I mean, that, like, like we talked about a great problem to have. That's another great problem to have. Yeah. I mean, you got, yeah, you got, I mean, Schooler, he's, I, I can't wait. Are people, yeah, I can't wait to see what, what he does, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, and then you have Boyer Randall. He's at the Raider position, technically a linebacker still from Michigan State. Then you have Rico coming back. I mean, it, it, it's loaded. Those four guys right there, um, and I'm forgetting one. I forgot the other one. Oh, my goodness. I forget the other linebacker. But those are the four that come straight to mind. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the thing that caught my eye, again, I, I got to go back to this depth chart that they released and, you know, linebacker and coach mentioned Merriweather was number one ahead of Rico a guy that has been on campus for four years now right Merriweather has been on campus since January and just apparently engulfed himself in the gym engulfed himself in the playbook and now he's listed as the number one linebacker on this team and that and that's really telling to me because you look at what Texas Tech fans thought and I was right there with them I think we all assumed that Rico would just kind of step in and try and fill those shoes of Jordan Brooks yeah, I mean, for him to come in, like you said, for a guy that's been on the campus for a few years and come in the number one line, that kind of tells you a lot about him, especially that also tells you how smart he is. He's able to come in, you know, completely different city, different system, different everything. And he's able to learn the defense that well, learn the play calls, everything that well. So that tells you kind of how cerebral and how intelligent this guy is. Yeah, no, I, I can't wait to watch him. He's the guy that I'm probably most excited about. Him and Easy e are the guys that, like, you, you know what, Tobias, let's do this right now. I'm putting you on the spot again. I don't, I don't care. I put you on the spot all the time. You know how this is. We've been working together for like three-plus years now. It's okay. All right, plant your flag on one player on offense and defense as your guys. My guys are Merriweather and Easy i I'm going to go – I mean, you know, I mean, I, li- I like Thompson. I want to go to Roger Thompson. I okay, go you can't Thompson. steal the Irving guy from me. Come on. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. Go okay. ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, yeah, I'm going to go Thompson, and I'm going to go – you got to go McPherson, right? Yeah, I'm probably going to go McPherson. Because, I mean, the thing is, he had zero interceptions last year. He, he, he has to get a few. Just, yeah. just how the numbers work. He has to get a few. I think he will. And I think teams are going to they're gonna target him early because they're not going to want to throw the fry that much. And I think that he's going to benefit from that. Yeah, positive regression is a real thing right yeah. now for McPherson. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's go over our breakouts for 2020 in tech football. You go first on your three. Just list them out one more time. Uh, my, my first was uh, – T.J. Vasher, second was um, Zach McPherson, and last is Eric Monroe. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I like all three of those guys for sure. Mine was Easy e Eric Izakama, Nelson, and Banasor, and then, of course, I had to put Kershaw Merriweather in there. I legitimately think he will lead this team in tackles. He's going to be so much fun to watch, just punishing people in the A-gap and running from sideline to sideline. But, Tobias, you got anything else? Uh, one thing just about the linebackers is, I mean, you know, we have some good quarterbacks. Like you had, I think, um, what's the name of Oklahoma, the quarterback? The, um, Rattler, Rattler. I think, yeah, Spencer Rattler. Those linebackers, they're going to be crucial to be for him because, you know, yes. you're going to have to put a spy on him because he's going to do a lot of magical, weirdo things. You're going to need someone that can, you know, just bust him in the mouth. And I think Merriweather, Schooler, or Rico, or uh, Boyer can do, can do those things. And I think a guy that's going to be underrated in that is another guy on your breakout list. I think Eric Monroe might be the spot yeah. for that. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I like that too. I like that a lot. Just come down and you just trust a guy back there, one single high safety. And, you know, you got to trust your secondary sometimes. But at the same time, you don't want, you know, Spencer Rattler running around like Kyler Murray back there, you know, beating you for 35-yard touchdown run or something like that. So I think Eric yeah. Monroe might actually do that stuff too alongside yeah. the linebackers. So sure. it's going to be interesting yeah. to see how they divvy that up and if they want, you know, a guy like Rico spying a Spencer Rattler or a Brock Purdy, or do they want Monroe to do it? It's going to be really interesting to see how that works. But, no, I agree. The, the linebacking core is – it almost feels like Tech is turning into, you know, a semi-linebacker you in a yeah, way. Yeah. yeah, they are. In a way, yeah. you know. Um, Obviously, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but there's some good guys on this team. There's some good guys in the yeah. NFL. Um, yeah. You know, you got Dakota Allen, Jordan Brooks. You yeah. know, Will Smith was drafted by the Cowboys not too long ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it, it's definitely uh, – And the linebacker that plays for the Dolphins, I can't remember his last name. starts with the O. He, he starts or he plays a lot. Yeah, he was his name is like linebacker. Sam, Sam, Sam Aguaba. Aguaba? Yeah, he, yeah, he plays for the Dolphins. He plays a lot. Yeah. 
No, yeah, he was an outside linebacker. Yeah, so another linebacker. There you go. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah no, there, there's a lot of guys that play in the, have played in the NFL, and then I mean, obviously, there's Zach Thomas, um, the Hall of Famer, uh, right. who played at Texas Tech too. But that was a while ago. But yeah, I mean, it's it, it slowly feels like Texas Tech, you know, is turning into, you know, they've been known for wide receiver you rightfully so but it's like slowly turning into linebacker you in a and not obviously like everybody's going in the first round linebackers you know or like Iowa where they have a tight end that tight end automatically goes in the first round or something like that but these guys will get drafted if you come here and you're a linebacker almost is what it feels like at Texas Tech but that'll do it for today's podcast again that's Tobias Bass you can go follow him at Tobias underscore Bass on Twitter I'm R.C. Maxfield at RCMB323 on Twitter. Be sure to go follow at Guns Up Nation on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Go get our cloud up on Instagram, please. And be sure to go visit our friends over at Two Docs. And if you're on their website, use the promo code GUNSUP. And if you have an order over $49, you will get free shipping. Again, the promo code is GUNSUP at twodocs.com. Again, that's Tobias Bass. I'm R.C. Maxfield. Remember, guys, always be nice to each other. Wear a mask and keep your guns up. Thanks for listening to the Guns Up Nation podcast. The opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the fan page administrators, podcast hosts, and fans, and do not reflect the opinions of Texas Tech University or its affiliates. We are proud to support Texas Tech, its students, alumni, and fans.